Okay, everyone. All right, as, as we now progress into you more deeply, what I would like all of you to do is to write down, you have one second, to write down um, one where, what causes you to lose power on this level. You have one second. What causes you to lose power? Who? What? To find something that for you, that you, and, it, and especially when you say, I don't want this to be true about me, but this is true. You're only talking to yourself. And here's the thing. One of the reasons why people don't heal, and I know because I did write the book on it, is because they're not honest with themselves. Their own shame prevents them from owning that this is true. So when I ask you questions, don't be embarrassed in front of your own journal. So in this first floor, this is about you owning that, you know, looking at, I crave this, this is what I want, this is, this is, uh, this is how I lose power. I don't want it to be true. If I get you up here, you would say, this makes me uncomfortable. I don't want this to be true about myself. But it is. Okay, I don't want it to be true that every time I look at Washington, I lose it. <laughs> I lose it. I don't want that to be true because I'm gonna, t I, I'm gonna talk extensively about illusion and fiction and I believe that down to my soul. And if you want to test my soul, turn me east. And I know it. And I'm going to teach you archetypes better than anybody. And my soul knows the truth of every word I'm going to teach you. And it is anguish to me that I cannot reside in that realm 24-7. It is an actual suffering for me. A suffering. And that's the truth. It is a suffering. And that is what suffering is when you do know better and you struggle because you can't get that lesser side out of you. And you never get it completely out. But the, the journey is you spot it and you go after it. Now, I'm going to go through this as a medical intuitive. When I began, <clears throat> I think it's important to say, when I began, there was no, I, there was no such thing. I mean, I, I did not know anything about the thing that I was. Thank you for my Norm Sheely. But if, if it wasn't for Norm and for my background in classical theology, which I clung to like a duck on a June bug, because that was my compass in the soul. Classical theology, not crazy spirituality, but classical mystical theology. These were the two things that I clung to. The third factor was how my life had been set up. Call it divine providence, as George Washington would say, and the nuns. But I ended up in New Hampshire at a time that was pre-Google, pre-Facebook, pre-cell phones, pre-everything. I lived in a small house on a, in a farm I didn't even know I'd rented a farm in the mountains without any technology. And it had any, I had a, a, a television, but no point in turning it on because I couldn't have any reception. Okay. So for 10 years, I lived that way. I did six to eight readings a day with Norm and worked at the publishing company we were trying to set up. The point is, that was a life of almost a hermitage. I had a wonderful circle of friends. But my life was one of silence and quiet, not self and by comfort. I don't know anybody today that would do this. 
But the thing that it was so ridiculously natural for me. Now, if someone had said, you're going to go live in the mountains and be quiet and do readings for this for 10 years, I think I would have had issue. <laughs> but when you don't know, and it's ordinary, it was ordinary to my nature to be in quiet. I'm, I still live in total silence. Total silence. And it's very comfortable for me. I, I, it's uncomfortable for me to have noise. I can feel someone breathing in my house on the, on the first floor if I'm in the third. I feel it, and it's uncomfortable. I cannot live with a human being. For me, it's painful. It's energetically oppressive. So, um, I was blessed to not be burdened with this way it is today, where the first thing people do is engage in themselves with the internet. Who's talking to me? Who wants to know where I am? Who's, am I still important to people? Where am I? Am I famous yet? Okay, the values of the first floor are the most contaminating values we have ever had in this society. When it comes to answering questions about what is my direction in life, you can't even allow yourself to ask that question until you get to the primary questions. We'll get to those tomorrow, which is, what do I know about myself? What are my values? What is it I even know? What is non-negotiable? So we'll get to that later. Now, what I learned as a medical intuitive in my first years of that skill was I went in with a first floor mentality I want you to put down where you're losing power and if you are suffering from an illness. This is really important, where you are losing power, to whom you're losing. And in your first floor life, what you are where you can't get your power back. Because I'm going to go through the reasons and you're going to highlight them. Because this is about you. This is about you working your way up. Even down to having a belief like this illness runs in our family. I need this corporation. I need to look like this because that's what people expect. All of that is this floor. Who controls you? How do you know yourself? Who do you belong to? Are you your own person or not? Because I'll tell you what every soul wants to be, its own being. And you will punish others until you are. You will think it's their fault that you are not your own person. And it's not. It's your choice through every word you use, through every action you have, you abdicate your authority in big and small ways until you don't. And everybody, everybody punishes everybody one way or another until the day that they don't. Because we don't understand, we, we are so afraid that being a whole person means being isolated. Being that we can't ask for help if we're whole. We have no idea what whole is. Okay, now. So, I start out not even knowing we have a, this thing called a chakra system. 
I don't know anything about a human energy system. I know nothing about nothing about nothing. I know nothing. All I know is I can sense illness around someone. I know nothing about anything. Norm says, what, why, why do you think? What I do have, what I did know was there was a popular belief at the time, a popular fiction, a popular illusion in the language of Buddha. And that's that negativity caused illness. That was a notion that had been introduced into the common mind by the 1980s when I started. That the reason you were ill was something negative. It had to be from somewhere. It had to be from your childhood. Your parents were negative. Something negative happened. And it factored into the common equation at the time. It was one negative thing, and here was another common equation. And you put this down if it's an active thought form in you. That if you find this little reptile, and you learn your lesson, operative word, lesson. Lesson, operative word, is it in your vocabulary? Then, once you learn your lesson, you will be rewarded with the return of your health, for you will have done your homework. Anybody? So, I've got just two people that believe this? <laughs> Excuse me? Hello? All of you believe this. All of you, it's just a matter of how much. Don't even try to hide. Every one of you are attached to this thought form. Why? Because the, everybody was taught this. And you were taught at a young age. All of us were taught that if we learn our lessons, everything will be well. This is how we're taught. So it's natural for us to transition this thought to a non-physical being. This is also the essence of a truth. When, when social teachings contain a little, 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 it's ugh, a little bitty thing, a thread, tiny, however, however tiny it might be, of truth, then these little tiny threads Tiny, they're like the thread of a spider's web. Very delicate, but incredibly strong. There is an essence of karma, meaning there is some truth to it. This is truth in the penthouse. The thing about truth is what, as it descends the floors, and works its way to the first floor. It's molded and chipped and reworked and reworked and reworked to a bite-sized way. It's socialized, culturalized, ethnocized, painted and, and recycled until it's an aversion that we can tolerate until it's mythologized and packaged into a paper version of a God that looks like us, walks like us. Look, I can handle truth if it looks like that. If there's an essence of the truth in there, like homeopathics, I can't take the straight stuff but if you water it down, really just water it down, just water it and water it and water it and water it down so that I can take it watered down so the light of it doesn't blind me. Can you just turn it into a tiny little match so I see it and it goes out? And I can only see for as long as the match stays lit. So I know there's a fire. 
and I know it lights my way, but just enough for me to move this much. I don't want you to illuminate, operative word illuminate, my entire way. I can't move that fast. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. And so, once this truth comes down here, it looks like this. Um, if I'm good, bad things won't happen to me because that's how it is with my mommy and daddy. So it has to be that way with God. God's a parent. There's some kind of fair system. So if I'm really good, bad things can't happen. Buddha says, wait a minute here. Well, look, this is the way life is. Change is, the nature of life is change. Change happens all the time. This is the world of, 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 of energy. Enter Pythagoras. Listen to me. This is a world of energy. All energy is always in motion. So, wait. The book finder. The book finder. <gasps> the nature of all things. That was it. Yes. Who's the author? Help me out. Who's the author? The nature of all things. <coughs> Who's the author? Roman. Hold it. The nature of all things. Roman. Roman. Okay, hold it. I need to introduce this. Wait a minute. I have to work this in. Hold it. Okay, all right. How am I gonna do this? What changed our world? Okay. A Roman, a Roman, come back here. I am in what we call BC. I'm in the year But uh, I'm a contemporary of like Plato. This Roman writes, the nature of all things. He's a contemporary like of Pythagoras. The nature of all things. He writes the nature of all things. And he writes that energy, he writes the laws of energy. He writes that energy can't be destroyed, that, that matter incarnates into forms of energy. Huh? No. No, that's not his name. Huh? No. Loquacious. Loquacious. That's him. And he writes this, and he, he, he dictates the laws of energy way back then. Way back then. As if he was handed this dictate of exactly how matter is created. And then matter returns to the energy form. And then matter returns to the energy form. And then all the way back, 
This is the time when Pythagoras is doing mathematics. These people are getting the laws and the organization systems of the universe. And they're even understanding how our health works according to these laws. That it isn't about whether or not you're bad or good. It's about whether or not you throw off the scales of balance. And that's my point in suddenly snapping. I just got a, a, a that it's all about these laws. And they were, it's as if the rule book was channeled back then, before we started to add emotional laws. And that's the point. None of these rules of energy have any emotion to them. They have no sense whatsoever of, but if I behave this way, once we get behavior mixed up with the law, emotional behavior, things get messy. Are you, are, are you understand this? The laws are the laws are the laws. And once you mess up God with emotion, with personal emotion, that's when things get messy. As long as you understand that God set up the system as a law system and, uh, and step into the laws and say laws are rules. Rules don't have emotions. They have order. And so does your body and so does your soul. And if you understand from the get-go that your soul knows these rules and it operates according to the rules. Now let's go over here. So I'm doing readings, and I'm beginning to see that we are organized according to this chakra system. But at first, when I start out, I'm playing by the rules that of um, if we're good people, bad things shouldn't happen. Because those are the only th thoughts I had in my head when I started. And as a result, um, the way that I understood illness when I was first doing readings was that I would look for negativity that's, that broke down your body instead of the laws of energy and balance. And this is very critical to understand because I was not seeing as accurately as I could see. Do you get this? So instead of getting a full picture of the human energy system, I was looking down here and following the track of people that I was talking to because I was, I, I was, I was engaged in the emotional, psychological dialogue of, here's my pain, here's my trauma, here's this, can you figure out why this happened to me? And that must be why I'm suffering. And in the early years, because I didn't know my skill as well as I do now, I bought into that. I bought into that. Now, to be clear, to be clear, on this floor, there is that golden thread of truth. There is a drop of truth to this, but it is not the whole picture in you. It is not the fullness. And as you go up on your floors, as you rise up in your sense of power, you begin to be develop the capacity to go from seeing yourself and people in your life only personally to begin to see yourself. And here's where your power really kicks in, to see yourself impersonally. Now that's where your power kicks in. So long as you see yourself personally, you will only see your resentments. You will only, only see what, where you were cheated, who cheated you. You will only heal so far as you examine your wounds and feel that you have reconciled your injustices. You will only keep beating the mattresses and screaming. This is not fair. You will look for remedies for fairness. 
and unfairness. You will look for your support groups and, and you'll go and get these temporary fixes of sympathy, empathy. You'll be somebody who constantly needs coddling. Constantly. You will dwell in your wounded child and in your victimization and in your prostitute and in your saboteur. Because, and down here, that is real for you. And those stories are real, and those wounds are real. Because they did happen. And the problem is, they become comfortable. Because you furnish your floor. And you have your visitors. And you make wounded food. It's called nursery food. This is floors for nursery meals. Nursery meals. And people, people have, and, and the stories you tell yourself, you get enforced here. So I'm gonna hit a pause button here. Wait a minute. Teresa of Avila talked about how when you are spiritually being guided and you seek healing, you are, you're always getting that guidance to heal. You're never not getting that guidance. But, and this is woundology, you will fight that guidance because moving out of this lower floor is, is, a, is a choice that is so difficult to make because you know, you know how to street fight. You're street fighters. And you know how to street fight. You know how to be manipulative. You know how to play this game. And you don't, you, you don't know your way up here. You don't even know if you are going to like healing. You may discover that being an empowered person does not appeal to you. It's not anything you care for. You, you may decide that not being able to say, I don't feel good, when you in fact really feel good. And all the times you've been able to pass on your suffering and punish people and, and you know, be able to say, you can't talk to me that way. And you have to give up all that stuff. You have to give up words like, here's a power word you can't use anymore, deserve. Dessert you can, but deserve. <laughs> you have to really get into the word expectations, except with Dickens. Great expectations. You have to really start self-examining. What am I up to? Why am I doing this? You have to become a real not narcissist, but a real I person. Real I person. When you realize it, that you haven't been really looking at the inner self, but the inner me. All about me. And then you really have to go to the inner self. And it's an incredible journey. And as I looked at, and, you know, was doing the first level as a medical intuitive, and looking at power, a common thing, and this is where I spotted the victim, was it was all about people looking for vic their, where they were victimized. And one, 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 I gradually realized that no one, no one ever said to me, I'm ill because I victimized others. No one ever said, ever, I'm ill because I simply don't have the capacity to tell the truth. I get up in the morning and I know I'm going to manipulate others and I can't stop myself because I don't have any power. So my only power is that I manipulate others. I do it all kinds of ways. I whine, 
I pout. I, I, I don't talk to people. I make them come and say, are you all right? I make their problems my problems. Was it something I did? So then they have to kind of dance around me. I do all kinds of things. I punish people for hurting me and I never let up. Oh, you shouldn't have hurt me. I, I always complain. I'm a great complainer. Nothing's ever good enough for me. That's all the tactics from down here. I'm never happy. Why should I be happy? Because then people would be satisfied and they won't notice me. I must be noticed. Otherwise, what happens if I'm not noticed? And I said to one person one time, I said, I don't know, what happens? <laughs> what happens if you're not noticed? Does the, your world stop? Does the sun not set? What happens if you're not noticed, for God's sake? Well, I, I, it just was incomprehensible. And I said, nothing happens. Not to you, not to me, not to anybody. Nothing happens. So what if you're not noticed? So what if I'm not noticed? So what? Get over it. Get over yourself. Turn that into your spiritual discipline. Now, when I, this was, like incomprehensible to this person. These people, they, these issues are very challenging. And when someone says I create how I the source of illness, it is not what someone did to you. It is what you want to do to others because of things you did not get. It's because of the power you see in the outside world that you have not accumulated or what you think was done to you. What I wanted to say about Teresa of Avila was that Teresa says that when the spiritual journey starts, you are going to feel this constant compelling to pursue your inner self. It's not going to stop. And it's going to be an anguish for you. You're going to want to run away, but then you can't. Run away, and then you can't. So then you're going to decide that you can do it on your own terms. And that's when, she says, you're going to decide that your inner well can be done on your terms. And she calls that the, the place at which you will dig your own spiritual well. And you'll decide, I can be nurtured from my, my inner life as I want to be nurtured in a non-threatening way. So I get just enough of God as I want it on my terms. And she says, you know, you'll dig a well and you'll get that spiritual resource. And she said it will genuinely be from God. It will genuinely be sacred. But every well you dig will eventually dry up. Because it's not, it hasn't been given to you in abundance as a blessing. And of course, you've decided you cannot do you on your terms. But once it's open, it never stops flowing. So, when I was doing readings at this level, people were always asking, as you will, for logical and rational reasons why things happen as they do in your life. How many of you are still addicted to logical reasons for why things happen as they do in your life? This is an important question. How many of you seek reasonable re reasons, logical, fair, and just? You want your world to operate around that. And this is an important question. This is critical because it can cost you cancer. So pay attention to this question. What's the source of cancer? It's not what someone has done to you. It's never that. 
It's your anger at disorder. It's your anger at the laws. It's what Buddha would say, the argument with the laws. The need to have things other than the way they are. I need a reasonable explanation. Go to the book of Job. It's my favorite book in the whole universe. Favorite book. There's, no, there's nothing more brilliant. Where were you when I laid the foundations to this universe? I, I kind of ad lib Job, but essentially, where were you? when I laid the foundations? Where were you when I hung the moon and the stars? When I decided where the oceans would stop? And I don't remember asking you for a consultation of how do you think I should hang the planets? And you think I owe you an explanation for anything? Last time Yahweh spoke to, hu to human beings. Close the door, I have nothing else to say. Where were you? Where were you? This will be to me the eternal suffering the need to know how our life, our individual life, I want you to stand under the stars and imagine you asking, the nerve to ask God, would you please explain why things are not, I'm not happy. <laughs> go find yourself, go up to one of these cliffs at night. Look at this entire desert, this incredible celestial <laughs> How dare they? All right, this incredible celestial blanket that we're under. Position yourself. Then imagine you can see Andromeda, the Sobrero galaxy, Andromeda, all of the galaxies. And you, standing there, screaming, Yahweh, come here. I want an explanation for why I'm not happy. Yo, where are you? I, <laughs> I can't even say it, it's so ridiculous. I want you to think of that. You gotta let me know if he answers. I wouldn't have the nerve. Oh, Jesus, anybody out there? I mean, really, really. It doesn't, this is, but this is what you do when you hang on to that perspective, to that myth, that somehow we are owed something by this. We are owed nothing. Well, one of the great te teachings of Teresa. Somehow we have to fit into all this that was operating long before you got here and will remain operating long before you are gone. This system does not need us. We are not critical to this system at all. There's no part of this system that says, please help me out. The rocks are not begging for help. The, the nature's not begging. No part of it is begging us Position yourself accordingly. Humble up is your prayer. Help me to humble up here. And when you realize I will do everything I can, I'll do everything I'm capable, but I'm done complaining that I'm not significant. I'm done with that. I'm done with that. Okay. Now, as soon as you lift the word significant and realize your purpose in life is not to be special, and don't tell your children that, that piece of fiction. Your purpose in life is to learn and manage your nature accordingly and to listen for instructions and to not make choices that violate your nature. It is violating to make a certain choice. This will violate my nature if everything from if I <clears throat> um, say yes when I mean no, if I say no when I mean yes. 
If I say an unkind thing, it violates my nature. It violates. It vi and if it violates my nature, it violates nature. My nature, to nature. My nature, to nature. One and the same. This is the key to your health. This is the key to your soul. If it violates my nature, it violates all nature. What is in one is in the whole. Are you with me here? Okay. <clears throat> and that you cease to look for an ever logical, if you put your path here on the first floor, which is I need justice, I need fairness, I need this around my life. I want you to think of yourself on the first floor and what that is like is like saying the rules of life are built around me. Everything. Everybody's life, everybody everything. It's here to serve me. I have to win every game. I have to win every conversation. I have to leave every party feeling the best, feeling the most, having the most beautiful dress on. It's all about me. The higher rule, as you'll see, is I have to leave everything as balanced as I came. It's not about winning, it's about balance. So your new word is balance. Balance is your key word, this. This is your key. But if I introduce that to your first floor, your first floor will not get it. Your first floor will not get it. I, oh good. Now, I want to um, introduce one other idea down here because I do see this as a factor of health and suffering. And this is something I got in the early days of my careers in, uh, in energy anatomy. Buddhism would say that the first floor, unlike Christianity that has a definition of hell as a place, which is down there somewhere, Buddhism says it has a place called first world. And at the first world is what they call first world hell. And that hell is when you feel, see, consider, define that you are completely powerless, without power. And it's worth going into this because this is about power. And this is about you examining all the way down to your last molecule how you see power. And on your first floor, Power is so often about what we have, about where we live, about how people treat us, about whether or not they recognize us. On the first floor, it's not as Dostoevsky would say, you can put me in the, in the gulag, but you'll never put my soul in the gulag. So put my body in the gulag, but you'll never put my soul there. It is incredibly, it, what could be more the greatest challenge that any human being faces, our greatest challenge, is, is managing the power of our soul. This is what is meant in the scripture, in the New Testament, where Jesus in the desert for 40, 40 days and the devil comes up to him and says, hey, I'll give you everything if you'll give me your soul. Because you've really got it under control. And, and the whole purpose of that story where, where it says Jesus fasted, so he, he was vulnerable, he was starving, he needed everything from the earth, he needed everything from down here, he needed food, he needed water, he needed all of that. So the point of that story is he was as vulnerable as a human being could be. And that was when you are ripe for 
temptation to be bought. And the lesson here is that moment will come to us far more than once in our lifetimes when everything that is most valuable about us, our power, is so easily bought like this. I'll help you out. Oh, please. Oh, please. And the next thing you know, you've abdicated your power of choice to the first person who came along. To the first person who came along. You've, oh, thank God, someone's carrying me. Oh, thank God. And in return, what? In return, I want, I want. Within three seconds, take whatever you need. Take my power. How much of my power do you want? That is what that story is about. Instead of being able to say, I, can, I have to go through this. A lot is being taken from me. Nothing is going to be harder. Instead of saying, I got to get out of here for a second. I have to go up to the panel. What, less, what story is, what test is this? What, where am I? Because this will happen to everybody. The last thing I got to do is think this is only happening to me. This is, okay, what do I have to do here? I need a map. I need it fast and I need it. I will be approached by somebody who will say, I'll get you out of this if you give me your soul. What time is that person coming? The smart person. Or I will go, somebody's going to come and say, if you give me your spirit, I'll get you out of this. It may be in the form of money. It may be in the form of this. It may be in the form of that. I'm going to tell you what happened. You know, a lot of these people are calling older people and scamming them. And one of these people called my mother. My mother calls me and says, and I happened to be on a phone call with um, my spiritual director. And everyone knows that's a sacred time for me. And I, I've been with him for 18 years and that's my sacred time and it's every week. And I, that's sacred time. So my mother called. And I said, and I, and I so took the call and I said, are you all right? And she had a funny sound in her voice. She said, well, Kara, I said, do you, do you need me right now? Right now. And I sh I'm just so used to that sanctuary. I said, is it an emergency? And she said, well, no. And I said, I'll call you in just a few minutes. So I called and she wasn't there. Now my mom is 90. All right. So then she calls me back in about a half hour, 20 minutes, something like that, to tell me that she had received a phone call from my nephew who had, no, from, from a lawyer first, who said that my nephew had been in an accident, had hurt his face, so he's going to sound funny that he's going to call, but only has a couple of minutes, two, three minutes to talk. That this, and the lawyer says, now you, he's in jail and needs $5,000 bail money that has to come in the form of these gift cards from Target. <laughs> okay, and not to tell anybody at all, not anybody, nobody. So then this nephew calls my mother, who, my nephew, I mean this person, who would be her grandson, and says, Grandma? You know, and, and, my, and my mom is also has hearing loss now. And more than likely, she didn't have her hearing aids in, in, in you know. So she said, you know, Joe, yes, Grandma. You know, so the combination of that and, you know, so she calls me up and I said, what? And she said, you can't call. You can't call. The lawyer said you can't call. And, and you know, at first you're very discombobulated. 
And I thought, if my nephew were in that kind of trouble, he wouldn't be calling her, he'd be calling me. And number two, he wouldn't be in jail at all. Number three, his wife would be after him or his sisters and like the whole thing. So I called David and I said, mew, 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 mew. this is a scam. And I thought, yeah, you, know, you have to have your sense knocked in, right? So I called her, she had gone to Target. Oh. Yeah, she had gone to Target. Mm -hmm. And someone at Target said, um, you, what do you need all these cards for? What do you need all these gift cards for? They're on to this. But they couldn't exactly say, no, we're not selling you them. But they've been, they've been guided on how to at least talk to these older people. My mom said, I, I just need them. Well, she didn't have enough money on her, her, her um, credit line, on her Target card, didn't go up that much. So she comes home forlorn. And she calls me up and she said, they t I called the lawyer back, that guy's lawyer, and he said, well, you go to the bank and get a line of credit then. And I said, Mom, this is a sham. Don't do this. And she said, I don't know, but I called. And she now, now, okay, this is spell casting. And you think, all of us think we're not susceptible. All of us think we're not susceptible. That some alert can go out, a missile coming in. Hawaii. All of us think we're not susceptible to standing out and saying, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute, before that thought form gets in here. I can't let that thought form. Someone saying something to you like, I would never wear that vest. It looks absolutely awful, or I want that vest. Whatever someone says to you, it's an incoming thought form. And you being able to hold your center and stop something and say, that's it, I, don't, I can't engage in this. I can't. What is the difference with you being able to discern? I can't let that kind of vibration in my field. What is the difference between saying, I can't, I can't, I, that, that's bad, that, that throws me off balance. I don't, I don't allow, what is the difference between you saying, I don't eat sugar, I'm a diabetic, and come up here. I don't allow those thoughts in me now. I regulate my vibrational diet now. I've advanced. Not only do I, I, I balance my physical diet, I now balance my vibrational diet. It's not enough, people, to just do your physical if you don't do your vibrational. This is stronger. Okay, so anyway, the long and the short of it is, I was terrified my mom was gonna call and give him. So I got to her condo, and I see the name of that lawyer, and I call him. <laughs> and I said, well, because he knew my mom's name, and he knew the name of my nephew. And I said, so, I said, if you've done your, I said, uh, you could, so I said, your, this, your name isn't Mark, it's Martin. Who is this? And that's, of course, he was a little more colorful in his language. I said, who's this? And I said, if you had done your homework, you'd realize that you were calling a woman whose daughter was the premier psychic in the world. <laughs> I said, you foolish, foolish man. <laughs> well, who the is this? And I said, no, 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 no. I said, it's my turn. And the stupid man did not hang up. <laughs> And I said, I have enlisted the assistance of all my colleagues, all my psychic colleagues, and we found you. <laughs> and I said, you did, I said, you listen to me. I own you now. <laughs> right. I, said, I, 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 I said, you listen to me. 
I said, we are coming for you. <laughs> I said, and it won't be pretty. I said, we are stealth bombers and we come at night. I said, we are coming into your thoughts. We're coming into your energy field. We own you. And I said, look at your place, it's filthy. What the hell, where are you? <laughs> I said, you know you have a criminal record and you're going to have another one. I said, I've just begun to torment you. And I said, and you listen to me. If you ever attempt to drive your car again, you will have an accident and you will lose a limb one by one. I said, if you ever try to harm an elderly person again, you will lose one limb at a time. I said, your only option now is to stop it. I said, we are watching you. If you ever harm another person, I said, we will get you limb by limb. That accident will happen. One day, I said, you are never off the hook. Do you understand? Blah, 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 blah. I, 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 I. So I hung up the phone. So he calls back and he said, blah, 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 blah. I said, ah! I said, you listen to me. Did you call back by yourself or did I make you call? <laughs> I said, I own you forever. <laughs> said, don't you dare harm another. Your soul is mine. <laughs> now, if I were him, would you call another old person? <laughs> Ever? Okay. No. Some days, some days you have to beat the crap out of people to make them go back to the good. <laughs> It's too good. It reminds me of Stevie Pajoli. I gotta tell you, turning in is turn turning honest is, is is how did he say it? Turning honest is bad for business. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, now. Are you connecting dots on your own power base here? Okay. With me. After a while, I realized that power was more internal than external. That what determined how we saw our external world had to do with the next level, which was our inner world. That our psychological, emotional, that our issues of beliefs determined how we saw our physical power. That what we believed, what we associated, was how we then went about getting, organizing our physical life. So that's when I started to really chart, what is it you feel? What, what are your feelings? How, de how deep, how complex the emotional nature? That's when that next level of us became very important, the wounds, the level of wounds. And I realized that when we start our inner journey, everybody starts at the wounded level. It's like square one. It's square one. Why do we start there? I think, I suspect we started our wounds because if we started in our strength, it's like starting from the top of our tree and no one begins there. And if it just doesn't, we have to scaffold that part of ourself. I also think we start out like, you know, here's my, my last drawing. Thank God, I'm just so complicated here. Okay. You know, when we're tribal, our tribe manages our heart. This is who you'll love, this is who you don't love, da-da-da-da. 
So when I started to do readings, and I start, when I look at your wounds, they're multi-layered. There's the way your tribe sees it in you. Then there's the next level of how you structure a wound. And then there's the next. So if you think you're simple, you better think again. This is the reason I don't do readings anymore. When it started out years ago, I simply read it the first floor and it was so easy. I could sit with someone for an hour, hour and a half and, and, and you know, say, look, this, you had tribal issues and your sexuality and your self-esteem and we'd, I'd go through it and it was, you know, in the 1980s, early 90s, it, it went through the chakra system, and the chakra system was something that I, you know, da 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 But the more I realized our complexity, the more I realized we're, nothing about us is that simple. Nothing about us is that logical or organized. Our relationship with power, power is the fundamental ingredient in the human experience. So, in our first years, our tribe manages our power. And it says we, we will, you know, it, it holds us together. Because power is so huge. And it says we love this person. We don't love that person. It's a we form of love before you can even manage an I form. Which is why so often first marriages you fell in love through your we before you got to your I. Because your I is a different version of you. And your I is more like, this is eau de toilette, cologne, and perfume. It's the same you, but each is a different strength of you. And in the we form, in the, in the tribal form, you tend to do very much what the tribe does. And breaking away and forming your eye is, that, is a form of a birth canal. Yes? Okay, so. Um, when I started to do readings here, this is where I took a close look at the power of our attitudes, the power of our belief systems, the power of um, the positive, the power of the negative, and this is also what I noticed. Everybody was learning about the power of positive attitudes, agreed? But nobody applied them to anything other than their illness and their health. People were not taking that information and taking it out and saying, applying it to the creation of better friendships at work. Nobody. Nobody was taking their attitudes and saying, how come we're not getting along at work? How come this isn't better in the social field? How come, where's my attitudes in terms of building better community? Nobody was taking these laws and these rules and applying them to the larger arena of life. Absolutely no one. Nobody was taking these laws that they were learning to be the absolute truth about their bio-psychic na nature and saying, we better take, if this is truth in my, my, my body, how can it not be also true in our political system? How can it not be true in our sociological system? How can it not be true in the mainstream and how we're creating things in the school system? If this is true, why aren't we teaching our kids about this? If this is true, why aren't we applying it in all forms of every place we look? How come we take what's true and only put it right here in this little container of our attitude in happy land in therapy but we never apply it anywhere else, ever. 
because we don't buy it. We don't take anything about this seriously, not in the mainstream. The size of the crisis we've created in our society because of this is overwhelming. The massive depression, opioid addiction, everything is because we do not take our psychobiology, mystical theology nature seriously. So we have no idea what truly overwhelms us and what our psychic biology, psychic field actually needs. Because we don't go there. We have no idea about our own sensitivities, about our own psychic field, about our own nature, because we don't go there. We only use attitudes in positive therapy. And when we say the kids are angry, anger management, where we can handle it. But in every other place, we don't go there. While simultaneously, as we, dis as we learn more and more and more about our inner nature, up goes drug addiction. Up goes addiction. As we shut down our inner nature on one, we're opening it up on another. Because we don't want to go there. So let's be really clear about what's happening. It is not a coincidence. It's a tragic synchronicity. A dark, dark synchronicity. Okay, so, um, I'm, I'm, okay. At, it was once I pursued why people don't heal, which I look at and continue to look at, I did begin to wonder, well then, why, what is our struggle with healing? And at this, I realized that it's impossible for us to heal on the first, second, and third floors. Impossible. We can feel better, but we can never heal. So, I'm going to have questions for you after lunch and et cetera, et cetera, but right now I'm going to open the floor to, wait, are we going at 12.30 or 12.45? 12.30. Okay, so I'm going to give you a few minutes for questions. Anybody? Yes. Do you want to, can we run the mag microphone because, you know, by the time you walk over it's such la di la 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 and I'll repeat your question. What do you got for me? Oh, thank you. Hi, mom and daughter. That is so. I got moms and daughters here. It's so wonderful. So here's my question. Wait, mama. Okay. Okay. So here's my question: Is as a healer, and since you have such a large audience, how have you been able to find your balance and your power without taking on other people's stuff? Well, one is one very silly pedestrian answer is, I really am very cautious about being hugged and touched. I am, really. I, I, as I get comfortable with you, it's okay, but I, I don't like being overwhelmed by that. Uh, all right, but number two, I practice what I teach, okay? And as we pursue this and going up these floors, and I apologize for my appalling writing, but um, I can read it, so I don't care about you. But anyway, this, I'm teasing. The, as I got into my mystical life, as I encountered Teresa, as I began, I did not realize, I really thought that my spiritual life was separate from my work life. I was so not, so, I, because I, I, I'm incredibly private, right? And then what happened was when I had this um, kind of mystical experience, a micro, what I call micro-mystical, and, and my paths crossed and then they became one. And when they became one and the same thing, um, 
and I, I, I realized eventually that I was really a mystic out of a monastery in a contemporary way. Um, I've, I've fell into a kind of ecstasy and I have never really left that ecstasy. And, and I, in one of the mystical teachings is that this world is very impersonal as is the nature of God. And I came to understand, not just to understand it, but to experience it. Mysticism is the experience of God, not talking about it, not da 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 da, but to have an experience of such profound awe. And Teresa of Avila said, if it gets into your, the walls of your soul, even for a second, it's enough for a lifetime. It's all I had was enough for a lifetime, but it's the truth. And in that second, the whole world became animated as holy for me, as holy, but also as holy impersonal. It became this organized system of God where the laws are the laws are the laws. Just like the Old Testament sparkled with truth for me. Sparkled with truth. It, the, the laws of um, the order of the universe, that God was order, that God was absolute order, and so was our body. Our biology, absolute order. The heart works like this. Your system works like this. You cannot take your, you make, you cannot take your biology personally. It is an impersonal system, and yet it's totally holy. It is totally holy. And the soul in you is totally intimate because that is your personal part of what is totally impersonal. Your body was not designed to function you. It is not unique. There's nothing unique about having two eyes or a nose or ears. But how you use them is fully unique to you. And that is where your personal life comes in. Suddenly, all of that made not just sense to me, it became my life. The personal and impersonal nature of the divine, holy, and everybody, be, it, I saw, I could hear for one second the trees. I could see the universe for one quiet, profound second. Everything became this impersonal, personal voice of God, perfect order. And that's when I understood prayer. Prayer is the intimate dialogue in a universe set up with order, and a miracle is when God says, I will disturb the order of the universe just for you. I hear you. So just for you, just for you, I will alter the workings of your biology and remove that disease faster than it's normally healed, just for you. I will alter how your biology works, just for you. But if you understand the way prayer works, it operates according to the laws. You can't say to God, you, we, every choice we make sets cause and effect in motion, in motion. If I steal something, I cannot say, God, cover my tracks. And when that doesn't happen, they'll, I, I don't get to say, prayer is useless, it doesn't work. You have to understand the way prayer works. Prayer follows law. You don't get to be, prayer does not compensate for stupidity or for, being, for doing stupid, illegal things. You are held responsible in this universe. But what you do get to say is, God, talk to me so I don't do this again. 
and reach me any way you, you need to reach me, even if it means someone come up to me with a baseball bat and hit me on the hip before I get to that store to steal again. So if it requires an accident, so be it. And you don't get to say, some God, look at me, now I'm in a wheelchair. No. It worked, didn't it? It worked. It worked. And now sit there and dwell. Reflect. That's how Ignatius got it. He got shot. And on his recovery from the Crusades, his soul got stronger than his body. Oftentimes, your, your body's brought down so your soul can bypass your body or your brain. Now, sometimes your brain bypasses your body so that you wake up and realize, you know what, I think I'm a brilliant scholar. Or just to balance the whole. You need to understand the system. The system doesn't walk around you. You need to get the rules. You need to understand the rules. God is law. And God doesn't have a religion. But God is found in every religion, in its laws, in the laws of Judaism, in the laws of Christianity, and the laws. There is no, there is no son of, there was no angel that said, well, you're going to get pregnant and give birth to a God-man. Jesus was a rabbi who was married to Mary Magdalene. That story will one day come out. You don't, they don't allow Mary Magdalene, they don't allow prostitutes to anoint bodies of, of Jewish men. Know your history. This was his wife who said, I have to anoint my husband. They wouldn't let a prostitute in there. No Catholic church history. They said, we better do something with this woman. We get a lot more mileage out of a half God, half man story. But that's a first floor myth. And it paid off, but not the right way. But that's a, we're not going down that track. Does that, does that, so for me, once I got impersonal, I don't burn, it, it's not a burnout. I can't, I can't even tell you, it's just different. But you didn't feel guilt for being impersonal, especially for you, you are associating that word with not caring. And that's, no, it's, impersonal doesn't mean not caring at all. It means I see the whole system as um, archetypal, as having these rules that work. In fact, it makes everything far, it makes you far more compassionate, far more loving, because the, the, the most self-inflicted pain is to take everything personally. Isn't it? So what is more, what positions you to be more compassionate than to realize there was nothing personal what that person did? A, a, a starving person will steal from anybody. They don't target you. If you don't get that, then it's your, the, then, the, then the sty is in your eye. You need to see the world impersonally, don't you? It is you who have to understand the, 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 a con artist will con anybody. And if you're the one who's particularly vulnerable, you're going to get it. But it's your vulnerability, and you are the one that needs to get things impersonally. There's nothing personal about it. There's nothing personal about a storm. If a storm comes and it wipes out your house, if you say to God, what did I do to deserve this? You don't get to make a prayer like that. The storm is not personal. You built in a storm district. You made that choice. That's what impersonal means. The last thing it means is that you don't care. It's a, it's a way of understanding. If anything, it makes you more compassionate. Anybody else? I don't give small answers. But okay. <laughs> I do have one request. When lunchtime comes, don't stop me. I'm famished. Okay. When you were looking at the lower frequencies, and when you were referencing the, the frequency of the energy, and I think the voltage, some of the languages, so 
in the inability to correct something physical from the lower level, do you believe that from, if you're at a higher vibration without action on the physical level, you can heal something? Or is there always going to be? You know what, that's a great question. That's a brilliant question. You know what, everything's involved. But here, you, you, action has to, energy creates action. Right, it has to. But here's something that's very fascinating, and, uh, and the jury's out on this in my head. Yeah. So I'm in the observation mode on this one. And I think that um, you take someone like, someone whose consciousness becomes more impersonal by nature by evolution, by inner growth, that their, that their consciousness just becomes more, I'm gonna use major, great big huge examples, but there's a lot of people in between that we don't know about, but just for the sake of a Mother Teresa, a Gandhi, um, Golda Meir, people who other people count on now as inspiration, as spiritual figures of some sort. Mm -hmm. And what that means is their spirit, their soul, is now attached to them psychically, spiritually, so they're drawing strength from them. They're drawing nurturing, sustenance. And so what is their definition of action? The kind of action required of them is very different than the kind of action required for me. Sure. Because every choice they make sets into motion gargantuan consequences. And, as, and, and consequently, the shadow and light that their soul is carrying is far greater than any soul will know. Which also means that the choices that, the, that erupt into their soul and the questions stirring in them may not be personal. But they may be questions that are coming from the impersonal that must be addressed through their personal life. And it's not unlike a, 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 a nun. My reflections class is named for this nun who brought this to my attention at a dinner party. Her name is Sister Josenta. And Josenta is the abbess to a community in London. And she's an Irish nun, and she's the abbess to a Catholic community in London. I was having dinner with her quite some time ago, and, and, and Jocenta said that she'd received an email. We were laughing hysterically that the bishop used email. And he'd sent her an email, and he was demanding a quick answer to a question. And she said that she wrote him back and said that she was requesting extra time to, quote, reflect on what he had asked her. And she, she, and, 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 but she didn't say this, you know, but she finished this. She said to him, you had all of this time to, you know, language this question, to think about this question. And she said, I need at least as much time to reflect upon the answer I want to give because the consequences will affect so many lives that I must not, I cannot do this quickly. I must pray on this. I must think on this. I must be still on this. And what she said to me, but she didn't put in her email, was he will think that this is a power play between a nun and a bishop. And she said, I cannot, that's first floor. She said, I cannot help what he thinks. I am only in charge of what I think. And she said, but I know that I am now in a position 
where my choices are not my own. And I will not carelessly spin the lives of others because I might be in a power play with someone else. She said, first, I must pray my soul out of that. I must reflect. That went and eventually, a few years later, when it came time to name the class, that conversation, and I said, Josenta, thank you. And that's where my class reflection, our class, the actual David and me, our class reflections comes from. <laughs>